Good morning, everyone. We're glad that you're here this morning and praising the Lord and worshiping Him. We serve a risen Savior. Let's sing together. Christ the Lord is risen today. the COVID virus to come in your car. and Savior, and we lift him up on high.
lift him up. He did. He came for a purpose. If you don't know it well, then you can just listen to it. Those of you that are tuned in to our live streaming, sing along with us on this song. Believe in the sun. I believe in the reason. I believe I've Is risen indeed. <laughs> I didn't hear a thing. So this time, okay, yeah, Shirley has her sign. Christ is risen indeed. So here's what I want you to do. I'm going to say it again, but this time I want you to when when uh, in response to that. Okay, He is risen. 
All right, yeah. And the folks back here, they, they said it and you flashed it. That's great. <laughs> All right. Now, uh, just a few announcements. Uh, we are live streaming this. This will also be on YouTube later. But all our services, we're doing live stream on Facebook. If you want to know more how to do that, you can contact me concerning that. Victoria, which we'll see a little bit of from the rain, and eventually he'll probably get thoroughly soaked. But uh, I want to thank all you guys, all you people for doing this. This is from your heart, I understand that. And uh, you're hearing the radio, right? Paul Wilson uh, purchased the transmitter, and he worked uh, a couple of transmitter opportunities, but they all fell through, and finally got this one, and we didn't get to arrive. And it did, so praise the Lord. Okay, I... I... Okay. Uh, I'm, someone's trying to give me information there, and I no, couldn't quite hear them. So, uh, you know, uh, I asked a little bit ago, about a week ago or two. She explained further to me the use of her bathroom door. She said Jesus was knocking on my heart and wanted to come in. So she locked me out of the bathroom and I was Jesus knocking on the door and she was me. I kept knocking on the door and she wouldn't open up and I got very upset and said, I want to let Jesus in. I want to let Jesus in. And so she opened the door and we prayed by the tub. My dad attended church at the same time and we were baptized shortly after. We sang songs in the car as a family on the way to church every Sunday. The old rugged cross was a favorite. I was six years old. The pastor of that church went to be with the Lord, and my dad fell away while climbing the world's ladder of success. We moved every six years to a bigger home with more toys. While I was in elementary school, I lived across the street from a Bible teaching church. My mom and I were there whenever the doors were open. I learned many Bible verses through their Awana program that have stayed with me all of my life. By the time I was in junior high school, we were living in a big house in a small town outside the suburbs. My mom and I attended a rural church that only had two um, young people my age, and I brought my Bible to school with me every day and was teased by the other students. I was a shy kid when I was younger and found it difficult to make friends. The kids that were not the best influence uh, were the friendliest, and so I exchanged my Bible with friendship with the world. My life went further and further from God until I was no longer happy with the sin in my life, and I desired relationships with people who knew Jesus. So I headed back to church. I knew I wanted God to be the center of my life, and I desired my relationships to be with believers in Christ. I was in my senior year of high school. My mom had met a lady in a jewelry store who invited us to her mega church. She had told me they had over 60 teenagers who were always hanging out together. We began attending there. The first Sunday, I met my husband and two years later, we were married. I had questioned my faith when I was younger, but too ashamed to ask anyone because I was supposed to be saved. Now as a young adult, I began to understand what a real relationship with Christ was all about. And it was not just attending church and believing there was a God. I began attending a Bible study, learning what I truly believed and why. After the study, I asked Jesus to be Lord over my life that day and that I would follow him and I would no longer doubt my salvation and put my trust in what he did on the cross and not in a prayer or an experience. My husband and my father at this point were working together and they moved the business and all of our family to Tennessee. 
I found this church through the Awana program, and I love that it was a teaching church and not preaching the same message every Sunday. I spent many years looking for the perfect formula to raise my children for the results I desired. Since then, I have come to learn that that is not faith. I've spent many years following solutions of my own making and missing out on a deeper walk with God. I'm learning to lean into God more instead of fixing the trials with hopes of God's blessings. When I look back over my life, I am in awe of God, how he has brought me through so much, and I can see his plan and protection afterwards. God has given me jobs that did not make sense at the time, that later helped me through difficulties of taking care of my parents. I watched in awe of how God had protected my dad in so many ways as he slowly lost his brilliant mind. And he came back to Christ in the end. He continues to provide for my mom beyond what I could imagine. God has protected myself and my family from all kinds of harm. He has brought beauty from the ashes of areas in my life that I felt were hopeless. He has given me supernatural peace in times of need. As I learn to lean on him more, I see him working in my life. I praise him. I did not have to wait until I thought I had my life all together in, in order to surrender my mess to his plans. There have been times I did not understand why God has allowed certain circumstances in my life, but I continue to learn to trust his love for me and his promises. God works all things together for the good to those who love him and are called according to his purpose, Romans 8:28. God has always been there with me. When I did not feel his presence, he had not moved away. I did. God's word is his will. Spend time in his word and you will begin to know how much he wants how much he wants you to live. How he sorry. He will show you how he wants you to live and the great love he has for you. I am convinced that nothing can ever separate us from God's love. Neither death nor life, neither angels or demons, neither our fears for today or our worries for tomorrow, not even the powers of hell can separate us from God's love, Romans 8, 38. And I praise God, I know that to be true in my own life. Mm -hmm. And I praise him for sending his son to die for us. And I hope each and every one of you knows him and the great love he has for you. Thank you. Amen. 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 Flash your lights and give an amen to the Lord for that wonderful testimony of what God has done in this person's life. Amen. 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 I'm going to ask the worship team to come and to uh, share with a, another song uh, with us. Then they figure out how to... song is a beautiful song. I hope we do it uh, as much justice as we possibly can, uh, but it is a song uh, talking about a glorious day, and it was a glorious day when Jesus uh, not only went, came to earth, but it was a glorious day when he went to the cross. It didn't seem that way, but it was a glorious day when he was buried in the tomb, and it was a glorious day when he rose again. As we look back on those things, as Victoria was talking about in her testimony, the things that seemed so inglorious or so difficult, so black and bleak, were truly, really glorious days that God turned into marvelous, glorious days for us.
glorious Take your Bibles now, if you would. We're going to talk about the resurrection today and what an exciting event that is. The glory is an exciting event. It is the culmination of what Christ came to do, in, in fact. We know that Christ came to die on a cross. Many people in this world today think that Jesus Christ came to simply just be a good teacher. You know what I'm saying? There are people that think of Jesus as that greater than Socrates or Plato, that one who taught many good things and many wonderful things and many philosophies of which, if we so decide, we can therefore believe or trust or practice. And so we think of the fact that Jesus Christ is is not in reality the savior of the world, but the, the world will look at him and think of him as simply a teacher. Well, I want to let you know today that this, the, the apostles that followed Jesus would not have died and given their life for a teacher, would they? You wouldn't follow somebody who is uh, just a great teacher and give your life for them. And it, espouse that teachings everywhere you went and become a, a prophet of, of Jesus or a teacher of Jesus simply because he was a good teacher. No, I look at the apostles and I see all that they went through 
And I realized that these were men, and along with them, the women that were a part of those that believed in Jesus in those days, who gave and sacrificed in order that they might tell of an amazing event that happened in time that they were witnesses of. Well, who were the witnesses of this resurrection? There were many witnesses in 1 Corinthians chapter 15. We see that, that there were many witnesses, the Apostle Paul speaking on the resurrection and convincing those people that who did not believe in the resurrection that there certainly was a resurrection. And he tells them of all the people who saw and they're still living even at that time. They were still living. But I want to take you right to the tomb itself. So would you take your Bibles and turn to Matthew 27, the latter part of Matthew 27, because we're going to go into chapter 28. There's just a small portion at the end of Matthew 27 that we want to look at. Again, I thank everybody that's here. The, the conditions under this, uh, these canopies are not ideal for our singing and playing and stuff. And, so, and for adjusting the sound, which is back here, when they really want to be out front hearing what you're hearing. Uh, and such, but uh, they're doing a great job and I appreciate them so much on that. And you're turning to Matthew 27. There were those that witnessed this resurrection that perhaps might be a lot of the people that we live with today. Let's take a look at Matthew 27, verse 62. Verse 62. We have a situation here. Jesus has been to the cross. He has died. And Joseph of Arimathea, along with Nicodemus, you remember Nicodemus, he came uh, at night. Nick at night, we call him sometimes, uh, because we know him so well, right? He became a believer in Jesus as well, the Pharisee. And Joseph of, Amer of Amerith, Arimathea and Nicodemus took the body of Jesus and did what the Jews traditionally and ritually do with dead bodies. They wrapped them up with a huge amount of cloth and pounds of, of ointments and, and different things, that powders that were to be placed on the, the dead body. And they found a tomb that had never before been used, which is interesting because that was part of the prophecy of the Messiah, of the one who would save the world, that it would be a tomb that would never been used. But here we have uh, here them placing the body of Jesus after they wrapped him all up and rolled a stone in its way in the opening, which was typical. In those days, they didn't dig a hole in the ground and bury six feet under. They had caves or they dug out caves and had big stones, huge stones that would roll over the doorway of the, of the cave. And we've all seen the pictures. But here we have a situation where the religious leaders of the day, the ones who were active in crucifying Jesus Christ, because they didn't want Jesus reigning on their parade, all right? They had an agenda going on. You know the people that have agendas, right? They'll do anything to keep their agenda. They'll do anything to keep the status quo of what they got going. And so here we have, verse 62, the next day, that is after the day of preparation, the chief priests and the Pharisees gathered before Pilate and said, Sir, now Pilate, I want you to understand, was of Rome, and he was the one who governed the area, the region. And so these people, these religious leaders, the Pharisees, could not really do anything without first getting permission from the governor, governing ruler, which was Pilate. And, Pilate. and they said to Pilate, Sir, we remember how that imposter, anybody know what that... Who was the imposter they're talking about? They're talking about Jesus. That's right. They're calling Jesus the imposter. I find that quite interesting because when I look at these religious leaders, in reality, they're the imposters, aren't they? I think that's amazing to me. But they have the audacity and the gall to call the one who just died on the cross for even them. He bore their sin upon his shoulders. He spilled his blood. He shed his blood. The Bible says that there, without the shedding of blood, there is no remission of sin. And Jesus became the supreme sacrifice even for them. But here they are in this situation. 
Sir, we remember how that imposter said while he was still alive, after three days, I will rise. Now, I want you to understand as we look at this, that even they knew what the teachings of Jesus were, what the claims of Jesus were, that he was the Son of God. I want you to understand that it is no secret, even at that time, that he said that after three days, he would rise again from the grave. He mentioned it. Tear down this temple, and in three days I will raise it up again. They thought he was talking about the temple that they worshipped him, but he was talking about himself. He talked about also that, that he must be like Jonah, that he must enter into, into the, the earth for three days, and then after three days rise again. He talked very plainly at times. Instead of using these, these metaphors or these similes, he talked about how he would have to die and be crucified and die for the sins of the world and then rise again. It was no secret, and they knew it. They knew it. We can see it. It's recorded right here in Scripture. Therefore, they asked of Pilate, Therefore, order the tomb to be made secure until the third day lest his disciples go and steal him away and tell the people, he has risen from the dead, and the last fraud will be worse than the first. And Pilate said, you have a guard of soldiers. Go make it as secure as you can. So they went and made the tomb secure by sealing the stone and setting a guard. Now we can talk a lot about how all that is, but we know that the guard wasn't just one guard. It was a whole bunch of guys, guards, soldiers, who knew that they had to stand guard. And there was a specific time that was the time that they must stand guard. It was that third day after he died, right? So there was no reason, no way, no how, that they were going to fall asleep on the job on the third day, right? You know that. Jesus, dead body, in that tomb, was not coming out of there because those guards, not only were they there, but also they sealed the tomb. They sealed the tomb. And it could not be broken by, except by reason by, of Pilate, of, of the rulers of the day, and it was not going to happen. These group, this group of guards, this sentinel group, was standing guard. Now we go to Matthew 28. Now all the Gospels, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, talk about the resurrection of Jesus Christ, and it's so wonderful. You get the fullness of the story as we read it all. But I want to turn to Matthew at this point in time and stay here because I want to bring out some things that Matthew brings out for us today. How the beauty and the glorious thing of the resurrection of Jesus Christ. What a glorious thing that is. Verse 1 of 28 says this. Now after the Sabbath, now Sabbath was a Saturday. We call that Saturday for us. To the Jews, that was a holy day, the last day of the week. Now after the Sabbath, toward the dawn of the first day of the week, First day of the week is what? Sunday. You've got it. Mary Magdalene and the other Mary went to see the tomb. Now, we understand by reading the other Gospels that there were other ladies there too, other women who had gone. In fact, they had seen uh, Joseph of Arimathea and Nicodemus do all that they did with the body of Jesus, wrapping it up and putting all those things, uh, powders and stuff, on him. And they saw that and they were going to come back later. And here they are coming back on the first day of the, of the week. And behold, verse 2, there was a great earthquake, for an angel of the Lord descended from heaven and came and rolled back the stone and sat on it. Now, this is interesting to me. I don't know if you read the Bible and sometimes things just pop out at you, but they do to me too. But here, here we have these women who are going to the tomb and suddenly there's an earthquake. There's an earthquake because, well, for one thing, something celestial happened something heavenly happened something cataclysmic took place our savior the one who died on the cross for you and for me shed his blood for you and for me for our sins rose again from the grave and the angel of the lord the bible says descended in that moment of time they descended and rolled back the stone and the angel sat upon the stone he just sat up there on that stone now, I don't know about you, but that just seems weird to me that he would just sit up on this, this round stone, up on top of the round stone. He sat on the stone. Now, why didn't he just sit down below or stand there or wait? Didn't he, you know, I mean, what was that all about? This was one relaxed angel of the Lord. He went up there and he sat on the stone. 
right after this earthquake happened. Well, let me explain to you, and as the Word of God explains to us, what the appearance of this angel looked like. His appearance, verse 3, was like lightning, and his clothing, white as snow, stood out in stark contrast to that cemetery that they were in. Stark contrast to the dawning darkness. It was like lightning and his clothing white as snow. Now you got to remember who's there at this tomb. The soldiers, the squad of soldiers are there at this tomb. And verse 4 says, And for fear of him, the guards trembled and became like dead men. They became like dead men. They fell down. They, they were overwhelmed. Now think about this. These guards were put in place because the religious leaders said the disciples were going to come on the third day and they would probably steal that. We don't want this happen. They would probably steal that body away and tell a story to everybody else that he rose from the grave. So where do you think those guards are looking at when they're guarding? They're not looking up. They're looking over here. They're looking straight ahead in the darkness of the dawn. They're awake. They have to be. They'd get in big trouble if they fell asleep on this job. Because right now it's the third day. You could fall asleep on day one, fall asleep on day two, but don't fall asleep on day three. Because that's when the disciples are coming. And they're looking for the disciples coming around one tomb or that tomb or, or a tree or whatever it is. They're, they're thinking of an ambush might take place. They're thinking of some sort of ambush that could occur. And guess what happens? You ever walk in a place and you never expect somebody to come from that hallway or somebody to come out of a room right in front of you or behind you or somebody to come. You weren't looking for them, right? And you're startled. You're startled when, they, when that person comes up to you. Now, I want you to add to that person that startles you when you weren't expecting them coming from that direction. And they are as bright as lightning. And they're wearing white as white could be. Just brilliant white with this light that's shining and emanating from them. You'd be afraid too, wouldn't you? I'll tell you what, it would stir you up like you wouldn't believe. Well, it did them. They trembled and became like dead men. And verse 5 says, But the angel said to the women, Do not be afraid. You know, see what they didn't say. The angels didn't say to the guards, do not be afraid. They said to the women, do not be afraid. Because the guards were dead men, man. They were down. And that was all right with them. This, this celestial being, I say these celestial beings because in other gospels, there's another one there. There's another one that's with this one. And Matthew only mentions the one. That doesn't mean there wasn't the other one that the other gospel mentions. It just means that Matthew just wanted to pick one of the, of the angels. So do not be afraid, for I know that you seek Jesus who was crucified. Look at that. The angel mentions and makes sure that they understand that Jesus was crucified, that Jesus was dead. He died. He went the full spectrum of a crucifixion. And the angel knows that, and he's remarking to us that he was crucified. You seek Jesus who was crucified. He is not here. For he has risen, and get this, as he said. As he said. It's no secret that Jesus was going to rise again from the grave. He already talked about it. He let his disciples know about it. He let those who followed him know that he was going to rise again. And as he said, he's risen. I like it in Luke's gospel. I think it's Luke. And, and one of the angels said as they came, he said, why do you seek the living among the dead? There they are in a cemetery. And they're looking for Jesus. And the angel says, why do you seek the living among the dead? Folks, we live in a world among dead people who know not Jesus Christ as their Savior. And we're looking for something alive and living in a world of deadness. And the reality is that there's nothing useful in a world of deadness. Jesus is alive. He's risen from the grave. There is an empty tomb. He's not there. And the angel is telling them, he's letting them know, he is not here for he has risen. 
as he said. And he says, come see the place where he lay. Now, nowhere in this so far, and you'll not see it in any of the other gospel account of the resurrection either. Do you ever see Jesus coming out of the tomb after the stone has been rolled away? The angel comes down, it simply says, earthquake happens, they roll the stone away, he sits on top of the stone, this angel does, the women are there, the soldiers are there, and he says, Jesus isn't here. I want you to think for a moment. There is a tomb that a stone was rolled away. Why? Why was the stone of the tomb rolled away? It wasn't to let Jesus out. Think about that for a moment. It wasn't to, Jesus was already out. The stone was rolled away so that you and I and these women could see that it was empty in there. That there was no body in there. There was nothing. It was a brand new tomb that had never been used before. And so there would be no other bodies in there. See, it was typical that you have a tomb and it was carved out, this tomb, and your whole family would be buried in the same tomb. So when, you know, grandma and grandpa passed away, they'd go in that tomb. And when you'd passed away, you'd, you'd be put in there too. And, and the whole thing like that. There was nobody in there that you could confuse with Jesus. It was a brand new tomb. And the stone wasn't rolled away so that Jesus could get out. Jesus was already out. The stone was rolled away so that you could see and these ladies could see. We could see that the tomb was empty. What do you do when you want to show something is empty? You open the top of the box. You lift up the lid. You do different things. You open the door. You see it's empty. That's what the angel did. That's the purpose of the angel was to meet them there and say, look at the empty tomb. My friends, I want you to know that the tomb is empty. Just like the angel says, come see. Come take a look. The angel said, come take a look. Now we understand here, it doesn't tell us if the ladies went in there, but in other portions of scripture, it says that the ladies didn't go in there. They quickly ran off. And in fact, others went in first. But here we have here, as we read in Matthew 28, the angel in verse 7 says, uh, come, in verse 6, come see the place where he lay. In verse 7, then go quickly and tell his disciples that he has risen from the dead. And behold, he is going before you to Galilee. There you will see him. See, I have told you. So they departed quickly from the tomb. They departed quickly from the tomb. I don't think the ladies even went in there, based on what I read in the other Gospels. That they got the message from the angel, and right away they were obedient to that message, and they went to get to the, the disciples and tell them the good news of a Savior, Jesus. He is alive. He's risen from the grave. He is not there. But I want you to know that it says about their emotional state in this, in this moment, it says in verse 8, so they departed quickly from the tomb with fear and great joy. Fear and great joy. Fear and great joy. How can they two coexist within our emotional state? I, I believe there was some difficulty that these women faced. They couldn't doubt the celestial being that sat upon the stone with all its brilliance. They couldn't doubt there was something amazing going on. They couldn't doubt that there is an empty tomb, although I'm not sure they went in to verify that. The disciples went in later to, and verified that. Peter and John ran to the tomb, and Peter went on ahead and looked in, and he saw the grave clothes there. But no Jesus. Fear with great joy. There was joy because, could it be? Could it be? Could it be that our Savior is alive? Jesus, the Messiah, the great teacher, Rabbi, 
or Rabo Rabboni in the Aramaic? Could it be that what he said was going to happen took place and he rose from the grave? There was fear as well, not only joy, but fear. He's gone. Did someone take him? Are we sure? There was some doubt as well, as you could well imagine, because this angel did indeed roll the stone away and to show the tomb was empty, but still, could we not see Jesus? Is there some doubt? Fear and great joy. And they ran to tell his disciples. In verse 9, I think is an important verse. And we see this throughout the Gospels, that Jesus didn't just stay hidden. He showed himself. And behold, Jesus met them and said, Greetings. Greetings, he says. And they came up and took hold of his feet and worshipped him. Finally, they see him and he speaks to them. And they can do nothing but fall down at his feet and worship him. They worship him. You would too in that moment of time. You would see the risen Savior. You saw him die on the cross. You saw him being wrapped in grave clothes. And we're talking about quite a process where it was be, if you were alive, you couldn't get yourself out of those things. You can survive it. You would suffocate before you could ever get out of it. And you would die within the grave clothes. But here, Jesus is alive. And they worshiped at his feet as he says to them, greetings. And he says to them, do not be afraid. Do not be afraid again. He tells the same message as the angels. The angel says, do not be afraid Jesus has to give them courage. My friend, I want to I want to I want to encourage you just like Jesus encouraged them. Jesus is alive. There is an empty tomb. He is alive. Do not be afraid. Do not be afraid for our savior lives. He conquered death. He conquered sin. And these are the reasons of the resurrection. In 1 Corinthians chapter 5, or chapter 15, as Paul, as I mentioned before, was giving uh, answers to the question, is there a resurrection? He said, if there's not a resurrection, then we are of most people to be pitied. To be pitied. He says, without the resurrection, there is no hope. We have no hope. And our faith is nothing. I marvel at the thought of people who suddenly in their life, especially young people, think that there is no such thing as God or there's no such thing as Jesus Christ. And yet, throughout thousands of years, 2,000 years since the resurrection, we have preached the gospel of the resurrection because witnesses have seen it and they've passed it on. They have written about these, these cases. This the resurrection, resurrection of Jesus Christ is more attested than any other historical event in entirety of history, in antiquity. Jesus is alive. In chapter 15 of 1 Corinthians, Paul tells of all the people who saw him and says that those who saw him are yet still alive today. You can go talk to them about it. Jesus says as a result of the resurrection, he said when he was going to raise Lazarus from the, the grave, he tells his sisters, Lazarus sisters, I am the resurrection and the life. He that believeth in me, though he were dead, yet shall he live. Jesus is the resurrection and the life. He tells of a time before he goes to the cross to the disciples that I'm going away. And where I'm going, you cannot come right now, but I'm going to prepare a place 
for you. And I'm coming back. When I'm coming back, I'm coming to take you back with me. My friends, the resurrection is also a, a uh, message for you and for me that those who believe in Jesus Christ not only have the resurrection life ourselves, but we have a Savior, Jesus Christ, who is coming back for us. The church, as it began, one of the first tenets of the church is to know and to have the knowledge that Jesus is coming back. He's coming back for us. And it could be any time, any time soon. And the resurrection proves it. It is within God's timetable, just as down through the ages of time, from the time, the moment that Adam sinned, we needed a Savior. And the Savior was going to be Jesus Christ. The Bible tells us from the big foundation of the world that this plan was put in place, even before Adam. Sin entered the world through Adam. Life through the second Adam, Jesus Christ, who rose again from the grave. Romans chapter 4 tells, tells us that he rose again for our justification. He rose again for our justification. The purpose for his resurrection, another purpose for his resurrection, is this one thing, is that those who believe and trust in Jesus Christ, that he died on the cross, shed his blood for you, that the purpose of his resurrection is to declare you justified. To declare you righteous, not on your own merits, not on anything you could do, but to declare what Jesus Christ and belief in him has done. Jesus did the work. Jesus did it all. All to him I owe. My friends, he rose again from the grave so that all who may trust in him may have life everlasting. And if you're here today, I want you to know that his empty tomb, the stone has been rolled away. The stone has been rolled away so that you might know beyond a shadow of doubt there is an empty tomb. Jesus didn't need the stone rolled away. In fact, we see about it later on in John uh, when he gives his uh, uh, portion of the resurrection and later after the resurrection when he needs to encourage the disciples because even they struggled with the knowledge that Jesus was risen from the grave. They struggled with that. They thought maybe somebody stole his body too. They weren't quite sure. And you remember the story. They're all gathered in the upper room. And it was a door that was locked. This room was locked. And there Jesus appears. Now if he could do that, could he not just go through the tomb wall as well? He, the creator of the universe, and without him holding on to everything, and this world would blow apart. Our creator, Jesus Christ, the Son of God. The stone was rolled away so that you might know that he lives, that he lives, and that you might trust wholly in him, and that you might have faith, have faith, to do whatever God has called you to do. You know that after the disciples understood the reality of the resurrection Savior, Savior, they were emboldened to change the world, to go out and proclaim the gospel. In Matthew 28, we see here in verse 16, now the 11 disciples went to Galilee. Remember, that was where they were supposed to meet Jesus to the mountain to which Jesus had directed them. And they, when they saw him, they worshiped him. And even then, some doubted. And Jesus came and said, All authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. Go, therefore, and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, reaching, teaching them to observe all that I have commanded you. And behold, I am with you always even to the end of the age. My friend, Jesus is alive. He's risen from the grave. Trust in him. And he's called you to do a mighty thing. He's commissioned you to make disciples who will make disciples, to teach them to observe everything that the Lord has commanded. And guess what? Do not fear. Do not worry. He's with you, even to the very end, to the very end. Let's bow our heads in a word of prayer. Heavenly Father, we come to you.
And we thank you so much for the glory that we can have in this day and time of celebrating the resurrection of our Savior. For we would be lost. And as the Apostle Paul said in your word, O oh God, that would be a people that are foolish in our faith. That we would be a people that are certainly without hope. But today we live in hope, even with this COVID-19 virus. God, we are a people of hope because you brought hope to us by bringing your son, Jesus Christ, up from the grave. And we serve a risen Savior, and he's in the world today. And we have nothing to fear, nothing to worry. We can glory in that because our days are numbered, your word tells us. And not one of them shall fall away without you knowing it. And so, Lord, we thank you for a risen Savior. Help us in these days when so many people are worried and full of care and anxiousness that we can be a people that would come alongside and bring them hope, bring them care, bring them joy. A joy in Jesus, our risen Savior. We thank you. In Jesus' name, with thanksgiving. Amen. Amen. We close now with Roy and I singing this song, He Lives. He Lives. Join do this. And by the way, if you have kids in your car, I want you to know that uh, we have, um, we have an uh, Easter bag for the kids in your car, if you have any right now in your car, uh, 12 and under. Uh, we would like to bless them with an Easter bag. And uh, so let us know that. And then also some have been asking about an offering. Uh, we're not taking an offering today, but if you want to give something, uh, Dave, Brother Dave, is, will be walking around helping you uh, depart. And if you want to give him something, our trustee, he will get it to the right place. And certainly you can trust him. The closing hymn is, He Lives. He Lives. I serve a risen Savior. He's in the world today. I know that He is living. Whatever men may say, I see His hand of mercy. I hear His voice of cheer. And just the time I need Him, He's always near. He lives, He lives, He lives. Christ Jesus lives today. He walks with me and he talks with me along life's narrow way. He lives, He lives, He lives. Salvation to impart. You ask me how I know He. He lives within my heart. In all the world around me, I see his loving care. And though my heart grows weary, I never will despair. I know that he is leading through all the stormy blasts. The day of his appearing will come at last. He lives, he lives, Christ Jesus lives today. He walks with me and he talks with me along life's narrow way. He lives, he lives, salvation to impart. You ask me how I know he lives. He lives within my heart. Rejoice, rejoice, O oh Christian, lift up your voice and sing. Eternal hallelujahs to Jesus Christ the King, the hope of all who seek Him, the help of all who find. None other is so loving, so good and kind. He lives, he lives, he lives, Christ Jesus lives today. He walks with me and he talks with me along life's narrow way. He lives, he lives, salvation to impart. You ask me how I know. He lives within my heart. Amen, amen, and God bless.
bless you and have a wonderful, glorious Easter Resurrection Day. Let not the weather dictate your day today. Amen. You are dismissed.